I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> Probably like getting grade 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week is Brandon Vogel. He was in person, and uh, as is usually the case with technology when it comes to um, anything, really, that (laughs) I have contact with, uh, things didn't work. So Brandon was in Lincoln earlier in the week. We recorded. That recording was lost. Brandon is now back in Tennessee awaiting um, travel to Maryland as of recording this. So we're going to go round two. Brandon, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm actually quite intrigued by this. Let's see. Let's see. If we hit on some of the same points. Let's see if we go someplace else. You know, the, the podcasting has a long history of great lost episodes. It, uh, it happens to the best of us, and the the podcast reaper finally came for us. This is actually the first time that this has ever happened to me. Um, I don't. I don't. And, and like I told you off the pod, I'm not going to get into it because people probably don't care. But I have no idea where our recording <laughs> went. Um, this, I, I've had. One other time um, since I started here and, and turned this, what used to be a written Q&A each Friday into a podcast, one other time um, the audio from the other person has been unusable. There was just too much static and cutting in and out that I just couldn't use the audio. Um, but I've never actually lost an audio file before. This is uh, this is new territory. So we have a chance to... Um, to be better even though i thought the round one was pretty good um we'll try to top ourselves here this time out real fast i want to say emily giambalvo from the washington post is joining the podcast a little bit to talk about maryland and nebraska um she's going to preview that game saturday for us and then we're going to talk a little bit about the the latest issue of hill varsity magazine the basketball issue uh that should be arriving in people's mailboxes soon if you subscribe to hill varsity if you don't store.hailvarsity.com you can get it for two ninety nine. It's a really good deal. I think it's a really good deal. Um, find, follow, rate, and review the podcast. Subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Um, you can find it in a number of places. So hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to Hill Varsity. Um, follow Emily on Twitter. Um, she'll give her Twitter later on in the podcast. We've also linked uh, to her so you can follow her coverage if you would like to do so on our website. Brandon, we did not in the the first take of this we did not get to um the big news of the week so maybe it, it was kismet that it worked out this way um the the big news of the last week week and a half two weeks whatever you call it scott frost got a contract extension um and it seemingly came out of the blue it was people there were some people that were questioning the timing Um, at least nationally, some people were questioning the timing. Um, it was announced right before kickoff, a couple hours before kickoff against Wisconsin, that Scott Frost's contract had been extended two years. Um, his deal will now take him through 2026. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Brandon, what did you make of the extension when it was announced? Have your thoughts now that you've had a little bit of time to sit on it, digest, um, think about it. Has anything in your mind changed from your initial reaction? What was your initial reaction? Uh, initial reaction. So I had just gotten up to the press box before Saturday's game uh, when that started to come out. Well, it came out on, on Twitter first, of course, and then there was an official release to follow. And I was like, that makes sense. Um, which seemed to be the exact opposite. And, and I don't know, but I don't want to speak for everybody, but it seemed to be a pretty common uh, response within Nebraska and the total opposite of uh, everywhere else, because, you know, we had, there's a long history in college football of making jokes about these things and, you know, some real analysis about what is Nebraska doing? Like they're bidding against themselves. No one's coming in trying to sweep up Scott Frost right now, to which my point is, yes, that's, <laughs> that's not why they did that. You know, it was, I think, you don't want to read too much into it. First and foremost, there's just an acknowledgement of, hey, this is our guy. Like, we are committed to this. And year two, <laughs> things may not be quite where you would traditionally expect with a kind of linear progression that everyone hopes happens when a new coach takes over. But 
to, to offer that extension essentially said, but we're okay. Like we're okay with what we've seen that's happening. And I think that's, that's all fine. Yeah. It, it, it might be funny uh, when you can just point to Nebraska's record at that point. But again, like it wasn't about that. So I thought it was a smart move. Yeah. I thought it was investment instability. This felt like an acknowledgement of frost. It felt like, it also felt like an acknowledgement that, um, Hey, this is probably going to take a little bit longer than they anticipated. And Scott has kind of hinted at that, um, increasingly over the last month or so in his press conference where he he's, he's started to be a little bit more open about, Hey, um, there are things that we're going through that we didn't even anticipate. And, And it's, Weird because he said some of this, like I'm thinking about the uh, Purdue press conference in year one after the game where he was talking about some of the stuff we inherited we knew about, some of the stuff we didn't know um, we were going to have to deal with. And and he has made comments um, this season basically alluding to that same fact that they're still finding out um, cracks or blemishes within this program that they didn't even know was there. And and this felt like an acknowledgement – from from Scott's bosses, from higher ups, that yeah, we see those things too. You have the runway to to build this thing the way that you want, and and like you said, it hasn't been the year two that anybody expected. Um, and I don't think that I don't think that Frost was on the hot seat. I don't think that there was um, anybody within the administration that thought that or or that questioned that he wasn't going to be the guy moving forward, so to speak. Or, or that you know there was a possibility that he was a wrong choice, um, but this just felt like, like like Bill Moose said, he wanted to do it, he wanted to give Scott those extra years, so why not, right? Why not? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, it, it was also maybe a, an indication that, and I'm careful with these things because you know three years down the road, like things can be vastly different. But right now I think it is kind of an acknowledgement of we're willing to do this differently. And by differently, I mean like Nebraska has been on this kind of treadmill, you know, a couple of times Callahan got four years, Riley got three, Bo got nine. Uh, but like probably six years in, it became, oh, Nebraska's going to go nine and four. Is that all they can do? Like, and, and Bo started to show up on kind of like, we'll call them hot seat list, lists for ease of labeling them. But they were just kind of like, oh, you know, a bad season here. Like, is there is there something here? This gets rid of that a little bit. Like, I don't think there was ever going to be any validity to them. But depending on how these last two games go for Nebraska, like, Frost was going to get those kind of like, eh, keep a close eye on Nebraska and see what happens if things don't show some improvement. And this at least says no, um, no, no for now, at least, which is all you really get in coaching. Um, but, you know, you can kind of think about that. Like every coach would sign up immediately if they're like, yeah, you've got six years, but almost none of them get that now. Um uh, and like I said, we'll we'll see uh, as as things go forward. But I I think what that that extension for now is is earnest. Like if it's into year six, I don't think there's going to be a quick hook here. Yeah, it's and and the fact that the rest of the terms of the deal remain unchanged. I think um, Dan Wilkin pointed out that the buyout was reset, and he was questioning that. But um, the the lack of financial ramifications to the extension just i mean it just, i think it, that further proves that this was just a statement a statement of support yeah. for frost absolutely was and um yeah they went out and then lost to wisconsin but man, played really at least in some aspects one of their better games over the the back half of the season and you're getting ready to to head into crunch time with recruiting where Nebraska had quite a bit of work to do still uh, on on that front before early signing. So this was a, a calculated move. Uh, like you said, it was a statement, and it's it's pretty clear what they were hoping to get across. Yeah, let's, well, let's talk about Wisconsin. Um, the way that I kind of interpreted the literal timing of Bill Moose talking to the media, what he did on the sideline before the game, it was – Everybody expected Nebraska to lose to Wisconsin, so it's a little bit better optically to announce the extension before the Wisconsin game if you want to do it than after 
losing. I mean, I mean, some people probably thought 35-10, 35-14, something like that. Some A score where uh, Wisconsin hasn't blown the doors off of Nebraska, but also Wisconsin comfortably won. And I don't think there was anything comfortable about this past Saturday for Wisconsin. Like, I think there was a little bit of sweating um, on the Badger sideline. And, and I don't think anybody expected Nebraska to to play the way that they did. They're still searching for complimentary football, and we can get into that. But um, let's start with the run game, Brandon. Did, Nebraska ran it against Wisconsin as well as any team has done all season long. Um, the offense only scored 21 points. So it wasn't like they were converting the, the 500 yards of offense they had into just touchdown after touchdown after touchdown drive. Um, but they ran it well. How did you feel about the performance coming out of that game? I, I was shocked <laughs> early in that early in the week leading up to that game. I was looking at the numbers, the same numbers I look at, at every week for a, a lot of games beyond just whoever Nebraska is playing. And I was like, man, how's Nebraska going to run the ball in this game uh, when you're a little bit dicey in terms of quarterback run, not because it doesn't work. The problem is it works too well and you haven't been able to do the other pieces of the run game well enough. And your quarterbacks are, were worn down uh, at least going into that one. Uh, and then you had basically Diedrich Mills and thought Wandale probably wasn't going to be able to go. And he didn't. And then Nebraska just comes out. The offensive line looks uh, like a, a totally revived unit for, for whatever reason that might be. And Dedrick Mills looks great. And in his most extensive kind of continuous playing time and, and touches, and I was like, wow, where is this? Or where has this been all season? Because that's been really kind of the thing I've circled as, as we've looked at this season and said, well, you know, what's different this year or last year? The biggest thing for me has been the run game. Like go back to the Oregon days, UCF, that, that 2017 was a little bit, more pass heavy than, than most of the teams that Frost has been involved with, but this thing's built to succeed on the ground. And when you're not, it's, it's a problem. Um, you know, I, I do think there was a piece of this where even though Adrian Martinez had had his ups, ups and downs coming into that game, Wisconsin was still well aware. Of it. I think part of their plan was like, he's not going to beat us with his legs, even though he hadn't run the ball that well, at least compared to his freshman year. So maybe that opened things up a little bit, but I mean, I know you looked into this, like just go back and watch the offensive line and like really focus on it. There were guys, and I think all of them at various times doing things that they haven't, or they either weren't able to, or, or just hadn't done to that point. And, and that's pretty encouraging for Nebraska's last two games. Yeah, it's really encouraging. Um, two guys that were viewed as developmental pieces this season or projects this season and Trent Hickson and Cam Jurgens. I thought Trenton had probably his best game of the year, and Cam Jurgens, if it wasn't his best game, it was up there, um, which is encouraging when you have two guys who theoretically are, are still in the, um, we are getting them physically prepared for this, as opposed to they are physically prepared for this kind of team, like for them to have um, the games that they did and for them to be able to move a, a Wisconsin line that like, look, it's a, it's a really good Wisconsin defense. Like they were top 10 in um, about as many defensive statistical categories as, as there are. Um, There's a good Wisconsin defense and a good Wisconsin front seven. And, and Nebraska was opening up holes. Dedrick Mills made a comment after the game. He's like, I could only run into my guys, which <laughs> side note, I love <laughs> Dedrick Mills's confidence and his bravado in post game or, or just in availabilities in general. Um, he is not afraid to maybe ruffle a few feathers with, with things that he says. Um, Brandon, the, the defensive side of it, Nebraska gave up 200 yards rushing to Jonathan Taylor. Um, it, but, but it was the lowest, <laughs> lowest, lowest yardage total he's had in three <laughs> game, three years against Nebraska. Um, so maybe a little bit of improvement there. Um, they gave up 37 points. You could take away the seven from, um, the kickoff return, you if you want to take seven away from the, the quick change after the turnover, um, Eric Chenander this this past week kind of pushed back on the notion that his defense is just hemorrhaging points, which I thought was good for him um, because they're not. But Mo Berry said after the game, at some point after the game, I'm trying to remember when, but he said that he thought that they were um, good in run defense, and that was met with um, some 
I guess, scratching of heads as everybody was looking at what Jonathan Taylor did and what Wisconsin did on the ground. What, what did you feel about the defense? Because when I looked at it after the game, I was like, man, I don't feel terrible about this. But also, it's not like they look great in in the box score. Like, how did you feel? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was a little interesting to hear those comments from, from Mo. And, you know, I think that's one of those things where <sighs> – that's a piece of these games that gets a little bit hidden is like what these guys are actually being asked to do. And I'm not saying like his, his, you know, immediate post game read was 100% correct. Most people wouldn't be. I know mine aren't when I have to write a column after a game and then you get two days later and I go, yeah, yeah. now that I've watched this a couple more times, I feel a little bit differently, but um, I think that the big thing was like Johnson Taylor's going to get his yards. Um He's, he's proven that against Nebraska as much as anyone else, but there weren't a ton of huge runs. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I have to go back and look at how many, you know, they had, they had, they were hitting gains of more than 10 yards, but they weren't 22 yards. They weren't 34 yards uh, for the most part. So really they kept them in check. You, you talked about the points. So take the, take the kickoff return touchdown off the board and you're at 31 uh, and I know like this was talked about a lot in, in the week since that game, but 31 points on eight trips inside the 40 for Wisconsin is, is less than four points a trip, which is good. I mean, like forcing three field goals on those eight trips, which Nebraska did is, is kind of encouraging something they struggled with. Now the problem, <laughs> the offense, Nebraska's offense was worse, um, which is, which is hard to believe. But if you can give up less than four points per trip, you should you'd be pretty happy with that. And I think especially with how Nebraska kind of chooses to play defense and what they think they're eventually going to be pairing it with on offense. So that part of it, like you could take, you could take some, uh, I guess, positives from that piece of it overall, like it it still is that. Um, So Wisconsin had to kick some field goals, but they still converted. I think all but one of those, those chances. And, it's the, it's, it's those weird things. It's, it's when you're in your red zone or even inside the 40, which I like better than the red zone third down where you need the defense to come up with a little something extra. And, and like anyone who knows football knows those are high leverage situations, but for Nebraska, it just kind of seems to be the same down to down. Like, and I, I don't have an answer for why that is, but uh, in terms of what they're struggling with right now, that seems like, it, like it's it. Like, Third downs are the same as second downs or the same as first downs, but they're not, of course. Um, and I don't know how you, if that's a mentality change, if that's a familiarity change, like what flips that, but it hasn't happened for Nebraska so far. No, but I think the, the main takeaway from this and the, the thing that we're kind of both arriving at, this was this showed progress, right? And that's good given – Yeah. Um, the way this season has played out because up until this point there wasn't a ton of I mean there there was behind the scenes and if you ask players they'll be like yeah we've made growth in this area and this area and this area but um w- when the the end goal is a win when the 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 thing that you are ultimately judged by is your win-loss record there wasn't a ton of progress made this season and there are people that would argue that Nebraska went backwards this one showed progress right yeah it did um some of the familiar problems are still are still problems and okay like that's that's not getting fixed this year but it it showed progress from where nebraska had been the week before uh well two weeks i guess uh, when you factor in the buy but it also i think gave some hope towards okay well if you can build off that if you can do that against wisconsin and build off that, well, then what? what's Maryland look like? And if that one looks good, uh, what's Iowa look like? And, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a, a little bit of a kick upward uh, on this kind of sad graph of the season right there at the end. Uh, it won't be six, you know, four and two like, like last year, um, but maybe that's okay given how this year went. Yeah, because – you, I, you know, it doesn't. I, I didn't think it needed to. I, I didn't think Nebraska needed to win. I just thought they needed it to look good against Wisconsin. They needed to look competitive and look like they weren't getting blown off the field like they were against Ohio State. Um, 
they I think they have to beat Maryland. Um, and then when you get to an Iowa game, um, you you are very excited about this. You're you're if you've beaten Maryland, you're essentially in a play a play in game um, for the postseason, and, and you've got a chance really to to kind of reset and rewrite the narrative of this season a little bit because Nebraska started zero six. Um, in the first half of of Scott Frost's first year, they closed four and two. They started this year, year two, four and two. Um, and after the Purdue game, everybody the the thing that we were all talking about is a very real possibility that this team is going to close the back half of year two, zero and six. And then you're looking at, I mean, at least from a, an optics standpoint, you're looking at being at ground zero uh, or at square one, right back at where you started when you took this job two years ago, if you're Scott Frost. But if you can beat Maryland, regardless of how it looks, if you can beat Iowa, regardless of how it looks, like you're going to a bowl game and you you are able to um, change the narrative, so to speak. And and that's I think that's really, really important. The, one, of the, one of the things that I've, I've worried about is what does Nebraska sell on the recruiting trail now that it, it, it looked like it wasn't going to have a ton of progress to sell. Um, but but there's the chance there. Um, how, how do you feel about kind of the the I guess the year one year two thing? How do you feel about where Nebraska's at in terms of its rebuild, taking a, a zoomed out approach? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned. I think two two key things there when it comes to kind of national perception, which I think you know does, does tie into recruiting a little bit. Like for the, these these people that are kind of looking at college football as a whole, almost out of necessity, they kind of have to like take the most noticeable thing. So if, if Nebraska goes four and there's own six, four and two, four and two, Oh, and six. Well, it's like, Oh, here's, here's this pattern. Like what's going on there. If they go to a bowl game, well, then you're just like, you know, a lot of the travails and problems of, of the season get forgotten and be like, well, it wasn't quite the jump to division champs uh, that that some people projected, but Nebraska got two games better and they went to a bowl game and so on and so forth. So I think optically it, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of, uh, I guess, a more practical approach. Uh, record is ultimately all you're judged on, but I tend to, especially when met, met trying to look at teams progress, look at various power rankings uh, because they're pretty good now. Like we basically know how good teams are. Like there's hundreds and hundreds of them out there. Uh, I really like Bill Connolly's SP plus uh, because I know what it measures and, and I value what it measures. Mostly is the, the short way to put that. Um, and Nebraska was kind of, so I guess the, the general trajectory for a college, a new college coach or coach of a new job since 2014. So you're talking about a, about a hundred different coaches is, a little bit worse in year one, climb a little bit in year two. And then year three is like when you fully kind of basically get above what you inherited it, on average. There's obviously uh, 10 years that were much worse, 10 years that are much better that, that shaped that. The inter- interesting thing about Frost is Nebraska got better right away, even though the record didn't improve in terms of like just pure power ranking. How good is this team? better last year than in 2017, which I don't think anybody who watched Nebraska would, would disagree with right now. They're down to about where they ended last season. So not worse, just basically flat, which uh, kind of put a philosophical question to you. Cause I'm interested, I'm interested in what you think about this. Like if you know, after two years, you're basically going to be, say you're going to be three points better than, than average, which is about what Nebraska is right now in terms of its SP plus ranking. Doesn't matter how you get there. If you, what if you, is it better to go from zero to one and a half to three, or is it better to go zero to five back to three? It or does it matter? I don't know. Um, I, I would say just off the gun that I think it does matter. Yeah. Because for me, looking at it from an outsider's perspective, I'd be looking at them and saying, like, like the same thing that we were talking about before. Okay, where's the growth that has been made? Where's the progress? And and I would have to, A, be um, 
knowledgeable enough to, to know where to go find, um, let's say, like, yards per play or points per play. Um, and then I would have to care enough to to know what those are, are showing. Um, uh, but Scott keeps talking about everybody inside this building knows where this is heading. And everybody inside this building still believes in, in, um, in what we're building. And on the recruiting trail, on the recruiting piece of it, they just recently got an offensive lineman commit. Um, according to Greg Smith, the number one guy on their board is, is still a, a pretty strong likelihood that he's going to end up at Nebraska. So, I mean, my initial thought would be, yeah, I think it matters because I think it, it matters what you're able to sell to recruits and what you're able to sell um, as a program because the last time a national audience watched Nebraska was probably the Ohio State game and Nebraska was expected to be able to probably not beat Ohio State but at least hang with the big boys and and that national audience was shown a team that's not even close to being ready and it, it, given the way that they've closed out the season I don't think um, that belief will have changed and I think you know with as as little as I think some of the national um, prognosticators actually pay attention to the nitty-gritty details of of teams like far outside of their viewfinder I think that that still matters that perception still matters um but I I, like my my stance on this has kind of changed a little bit the the more that Frost continues to to draw a line in the sand and say no people see where this is going people are are comfortable with where this is going and and with you know his administration giving him an extension everybody seems to be aligned in, in that this is still moving in the right direction and and yes it has taken a little bit more time than we would probably have wanted it to take but it's still moving in the right direction how do you feel yeah i think that's uh well you hit on the key difference because i i think being able to to show some measurable progress and for most people that's not pulling up the various you know whatever power ranking you prefer um matters i think it it matters a little bit less if you can get a two-year extension when you're despite being eight and 13 so so that helps uh a a little bit um but what it effectively means like my point in bringing all that up is that while we think of new coach comes in might be a little rough but then things go up like there's there's a ton of different paths to you to coaching tenures that have worked out and coaching tenures that haven't uh what it means for Nebraska right now is so when Frost says people see where this is going, I I don't count myself as one of those people because I I don't see it. I think it's going to go there. Um, In fact, I I, I really do believe that, but I can't say why, because I don't, I don't see practice. um, You know, I don't have that view. Like at the end of the season, I think one of the, the first questions for Frost that would be really, really interesting to hear him say is like, what were the parts of the season that you liked? Like, what were the moments where you said, okay, that's a good development. And even if it didn't end up translating to wins on the field, like what were those things? Because it's clear he has some of those. So the way Nebraska has gone this so far, it, it requires a little bit more, a little more faith in, in just the process in things that you can't see. Uh, you kind of have to take the coach's word for it. I also think <laughs> and this is kind of unrelated, but, when things do turn, uh, as, as Frost says, uh, the phrase he used there, uh, it's going to be really, really satisfying for the coaches because <laughs> they're going to have been there for through the whole time. And of course it'll be satisfying for the fans as well, but you know, it's going to be like, where did this come from? Because it's hard to say, well, he, he, clearly we saw this coming like four four wins first year, supposed to get, you know, seven, eight did that. And then you just go up from there. Well, we're not in that spot anymore. So it's kind of made for a, uh, an interesting and messy narrative. And I'm okay with that. In fact, I think I like it. Yeah. Messy is kind of fun. I, I, I have been thinking um, in recent weeks. So I have been um, playing in a, a fantasy basketball league for, I think this is year seven now. Um, Cause I started at my freshman year of college. I think this is year seven now. And almost every single season leading up to this year, this year I stopped, I stopped doing it, but every single season leading up to this year, 
I looked at a sophomore, a year two guy, and was like, he's making the jump. And then he didn't make the jump. And then the following year, when I don't draft him, he explodes in year three. <laughs> and I keep think I keep thinking about that. I'm like, no. Well, no. Because the schedule to begin 2020, um, the first seven games are like very conducive to a team that could get out to a hot start. Now Nebraska needs to get out to a hot start given the last five games. But I keep thinking about that. Um, and, and one of the reasons I keep thinking about it is because of the players that are going to be leaving the program at the end of this season. And I'm curious what you think about the culture conversation. Um, Scott keeps talking about we need more of our guys. And, and there seems to continue to be this culture divide either within the, the, the team, within the locker room, whatever, between guys who, as Frost has put, are used to losing and some of his guys. Are you are you tired of having the culture conversation? Do you think it's legitimate here? Do you think do you, I, I kinda am worried that the the talk about culture, um, the 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 sort of dichotomy between Wando Robinson a couple weeks ago saying guys weren't all the way bought in and then Mo Berry saying, oh, well, yeah, we are. We just have to get a win. Um, do, do you think that that's a, a real thing that's holding this team back? Are you, are, you, are you, Or are you tired of talking about culture? Good question. Um, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a real thing. And that's one of those things, again, where you kind of have to decide how much – are, are you going to take that at total face value? Are you going to say, yeah, but, and I'm probably closer to face value than I am with almost anything on that. Um, culture discussions in terms of teams fascinate me, but I also know nothing about them really. Like, you know, it, it may as we may as well be talking about time travel. Like, like, yeah, that's cool. Let's talk about time travel. I don't really know much, but I, I can't tell you what's going on. Uh, I can't tell you what the, what the culture actually is. You know, I think back to big 10 media days in Chicago at the, the podium session with frost, he mentioned in response to some answer, he's like, yeah, he's like, I read a lot about culture, probably too much. Like meeting, he was reading news stories about it. Not like he's going and getting the latest, you know, latest hottest book off the, off, off Amazon that, uh, everyone dreaming about team building these days. And so I, I followed up with him at some point. I was like, you said you read too much about it. Why, why did you say that? And he effectively said, because it's coming from people who aren't there, which I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so does that make me more likely to believe him? I guess a little bit, but I understand why, why some people don't. I understand why it's a frustrating answer uh, because it's all hidden and you can't see it. And even more than that, it, it's kind of your job to fix that, right? Like, you know, that's, that's, that's what coaching is. And it's not that they're not trying to, but to, to use it the way that they have at times has, has felt a little bit like an excuse. And I've been surprised at how willing or how often they've gone there as, as Nebraska's losing streak has, has gone on. But I always kind of hold out a, a piece of it and like, well, what if that is the solution? And, and we'll know someday. Uh, not any, any day in the near future, though. See, that's the whole... That's I, I'm such an impatient person when it comes to a lot of things. This is the frustrating part about this. Because, like, you you said you were struggling to see um, the why when Frost says, like, this... Everybody sees where this is going. Like, I just want to get there so that we can see what that looks like i just want them to put up 52 points on maryland this week just win 52 to 7 just just i just want one week where it's like okay yep they did what they were supposed to do yeah that that would uh well that would achieve two goals uh keep the season alive but it would also like if they come out and play their best game since Greg Smith and I were talking about this earlier in the week. Like, what's the best game Nebraska's played under under Frost? And it's probably Minnesota last year. Like, they just, they did whatever they wanted against Minnesota. Yeah, I I know a lot of people who'd sign up for that uh, on Saturday against Maryland. Uh, basically, everyone outside of the state of Maryland. Um, 
well, maybe not everybody, but you know what I mean? And yeah. you do that and then, then you're into, okay, here you go. You're going to buy them. Uh, if you're, if you're realistic, you can admit that they're a rival. If, uh, if, if, you, if you're, you're not, then, then go ahead and deny that. But I was owned that series for the past four years. Uh, they do a lot of things Nebraska is incapable of doing to win football games and go beat them, go, go get a bowl game. Like that would be amazing. Uh, but just seeing like to back to the impatience part of it, like even for a game, because it's, it really has been, I mean, Ohio state game last year, Iowa game last year were good um, near wins for Nebraska, but where you're just like, Oh, Nebraska just owned every facet of this game really only had maybe one of those in the past year and a half. So it does feel like it's been a while. Yeah. Um, Brandon, switching gears, I, I know you haven't been able to to pay super close attention to what the basketball team is doing. You've been hunkered down with football, as has um, a lot of people around here. But we just put out a basketball magazine. Um, it's going to be showing up in people's mailboxes here. If you don't have it already, you're probably getting it soon. Um, what, what did you think of of the magazine it's a basketball preview it looks at men and women um at nebraska the women are off to a 5-0 and start they're really good people should start paying attention um what, what were your thoughts on the magazine that we put out kind of reading through and and um seeing some of the the design work from quentin our fantastic designer and, and player previews and, and i thought jacob's story was really really good on um the two guards what were your thoughts on the magazine yeah, I was I was really excited for this magazine. Um, we'll, we'll go a little inside magazine here for for the listeners, but uh, knowing that you and Jacob are are two of the smartest basketball people I know, uh, back late summer, I was like, "Hey guys, like, what's your ideal basketball magazine look like?" Um, and we kind of talked through that, like, you know. It, it's it's tough putting out a magazine during football season. Like football just kind of swallows everything. And then to do a basketball one, uh, Jacob's also doing volleyball. You're doing women's basketball in addition to everything you do. Like, uh, we came, you guys came up with this concept, sort of a felt like first day of school or new kid at a new school because basically Nebraska's entire team was. Um, so we, we went down that path and came up with some really, I think, cool pieces in the magazine. So, you know, the classic kind of yearbook superlatives, most likely to succeed, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we, it was a really smart way into to previewing the big 10 teams. Like, you know, if you're a, a hoops junkie, um, well, first read, read Derek and Jacob because th- they'll go as deep as you want, but yeah, you're going to get the season preview magazines and you're going to read about every team and great. Uh, but if you just kind of want to weigh in, um, I really liked the previews uh, for, for, for that approach. It's like, hey, here's what you should know about Rutgers basketball, <laughs> which may not be a thing that people are clamoring for, but it was written in such a way and it was boiled down and it was really smart. Um, so, and that's really, I think, what we kind of strive for with, with the our varsity coverage overall is to, to just inform people in a unique and fun way then you add sort of the de- design aspects of it, kind of pulling in some of those, those yearbook pieces. Um, you had a great piece uh, kind of looking at Fred Hoiberg's favorite sets and plays from his time at Iowa state and then with the bulls, which is like really, really useful stuff um, stuff. You're not going to get everywhere else. So I was really, really proud of it. Um, that's my view from the kind of managing editor as, as the person concepting us where, how did you feel about it? I liked it. I thought it was cool. Um, I was talking to you about this before. It the the inside of it has a a real '80s vibe that reminds me a lot of um, this kind of like fast casual restaurant. I don't know if it's a chain. I don't know if it's a local place, but it was back home in Oklahoma City called City Bites, and, and the inside of City Bites looks like the inside of the magazine. Except, you know, at City Bites there are like half ceramic cars sticking out of walls and things like that. But that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> It, it was. I, I thought it was really cool. It, it, the superlative section turned out great. Um, Jacobs was. Jacob had a couple good ones. Um, I got to use in the women's section most likely to be the conference's terminator, and I felt good about that one. Um, I thought it was fun. I, I think this is going to be a really fun team, and I, and I thought um, I, the, the hope was that that was kind of 
the, the tone was going to match. I think this is going to be a fun basketball team, both men and women. Um, I think the women are going to be really, really good, um, evidenced by a 5-0 and start. I don't think they have a ton of holes right now. And I think the men are going to be fun. I don't know how many games they're going to win um, just, you know, the, the, because of the way that they play. Shooting is, is going to uh, keep them in games that they're not supposed to win, but it's also going to cost them games that they probably should win, um, as evidenced by the first two losses of the season, where they <laughs> shot really poorly and, and, and lost by games at home. Um, but I, I think they're going to be fun. And I think it's going to be a fun brand of basketball for people to watch. Um, you know, even if the shots aren't going down, Gervais Green had, it was either the exhibition or the first game of the season. Um, he jumps up for a layup and there's a shot blocker coming and he decides at the last second, he's going to do a 360 spin in the air. First of all, the athleticism to be able to pull that off. I'm very envious because I would tear something in my, I'd tear some kind of ligament in my leg if I tried to do that. Um, but but he does this 360 spin, and he kicks it out to an open three-point shooter in the corner, and Hanif Cheatham, and Cheatham airballs the three. So, looks great until it doesn't actually pay off, um, which might be the case with Nebraska basketball uh, this year. But I don't think that was the case with the magazine. I, I was pretty, pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Um, Jacob, I kind of referenced it before, Jacob Padilla had a, a story on... Um, Gervais Green and, and Cam Mack, the two Juco guards, kind of being the the driving force behind this team that I thought was really good, um, that I think people are going to enjoy. Um, I, I think fun is the way to describe it. Shout out to Quentin for the way that he designed it. I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was good. I decided that I'm going to go into every Nebraska men's basketball game with the attitude of basically like, let's see what they can get up to. And, and sometimes they're going to get up to no good and it's going to be bad, and we've already seen that twice. But sometimes, like you said, it's going to be a ton of fun, and I, I just kind of like that. It's like ah, we don't, we don't. It was a little wild card. Like we don't know what to do with this. Like let's just uh, roll it out there and see what happens. And I'm with you. The women have looked have looked pretty strong. Got some got some nice pieces there. Um, that you know, I think the expectation level for them was you know pretty good coming into the year, but their play so far has certainly elevated it a little bit for me uh, and not to completely derail us, but while you're talking, Derek, I looked up the city bites logo and it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's awesome. And it's, uh, it's subs and spuds sandwiches and, um, baked potatoes. So it's, uh, <laughs> because podcasting is a visual medium, I guess maybe I should, I should, try to describe this for them. Um, and you can tell me, since you grew up with it, you'll know if I'm on the right track. And assuming this Google search is, is correct. So there's a woman with sunglasses, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe Oklahoma City skyline reflected in the sunglasses. But it's the woman from, if you've ever gone to any like small town hair salon, you know how they all have like the same clip art of a woman from like the 1980s. So they like a really sleek haircut. Um, so that's the woman. No, is that not resonating with you at all? No, you're, you're on the right track. You're right there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was worried I might've gotten too old for you there, um, which is certainly possible and accurate. Um, no, this but, is fantastic. Yeah. When I look at it, I was like, Oh, that's the clip art from every hair salon I've ever seen. Uh, and then beneath that city bites in a very like kind of bubbly eighties script. In fact, I'm wondering if this is supposed to be ketchup. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what you're kind of what you're looking at. Eighties, eighties hair salon lady, bubbly eighties script that may or may not be ketchup, uh, city bites. It might be ketchup. My brain, um, I, because I have also pulled up the logo and I'm now looking at the logo. My brain was like, it's kind of reminding me of a Sin City font from the movie. And so I Googled Sin City, and no, it's not the Sin City font. So um, it's, you're, it's you're, you're catching rem- up. And- <laughs> it's, it's more reminiscent of Drive. If you've seen the, the, the movie Drive, uh, pull up the, the Drive font, and then you'll get there. It's a script font. I have not seen Drive. Is it a new movie? Yeah, or is it an old movie? Yeah. It was like 2011, Ryan Gosling. It's on Netflix right now. It's it's. I think it's excellent. Some people really hate it, but you yeah. should you should watch it. Um, I I think it's really good. I am behind on movies. I is uh is the Sandlot a Disney movie? Do you know off the top of your head? 
I don't know off the top of my head. I feel like yes, although now that I say it out loud, I don't know what I'm basing that on. It feels like a Disney movie, but I don't know if it is. I'm trying to remember if it if we saw it on Disney Plus or not. Um, Alex and I got Disney Plus, and we were kind of going through the movie catalog, and somehow The Sandlot came up, and I said that I've never seen The Sandlot, and she uh, was very unhappy with me. Um, so I, that's that's on our list of like things that we have to watch. So I, I will add Drive to that, but um, okay. Sandlot has to be high on the list before I I, I am murdered. So yeah, uh, yeah, don't go straight from Sandlot to Drive. Uh, that would that's just that would not be healthy for anyone. Like it'd be like whiplash. Um, but when you're when you're in the mood for some like dark 80s music uh really cool driving movie that's a little bit weird uh you can you can check out drive I, I highly recommend it okay i was expecting a little bit more visceral reaction from you when i said that i haven't seen sandlot because every time i tell somebody that i haven't seen sandlot they look at me like i'm crazy and they do that high-pitched what how have you never and they get really <laughs> mad at me so it, it's good that i found somebody that doesn't get um horribly frustrated with me that i haven't seen that movie it's, it's it's good. I I enjoyed it. I I don't. Uh, I probably not as uh, staunch a. Well, nobody has to defend that movie if everybody likes it. I'm not as big a fan of it as as everybody else. It's just it it's good. Um, now, bad news bears. Um, and no, I'm not old enough to have grown up with bad news bears like I thought later. Um, but that's kind of more the kids baseball movie for me. Um, so, I'm gonna guess you haven't seen the original bad news bears. I haven't. It's uh, um, it's inter- it's interesting. A lot of stuff that wouldn't fly today, uh, which is you know, not necessarily a, a recommendation, but it's a, it's an interesting watch uh, to think of what they <laughs> what they were able to do in the mid nineteen seventies. Yeah, that's we. This is uh, I don't know how we got here, but we did. Um, Brandon, thank you for taking more time to re-record this podcast with me. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Joining the podcast this week, all the way out in Washington, D.C., she writes for the Washington Post, covers Maryland athletics for the Washington Post. Emily Giambalvo. Emily, thank you for joining the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So... Maryland is is three and seven this season. They're one and six in Big Ten play. Um, the season started with just a massive, massive win over Howard, but it was Howard, mm-hmm. and then they beat uh, then twenty one ranked Syracuse, and and everybody said, "Oh my gosh, Mike Loxley's doing amazing things at Maryland." Um, it, it has since come a little bit back down to earth, um, maybe. I, I don't know what the expectations were for this season, and you could probably speak to that, but um, maybe disappointment over the last couple of weeks. Um, the, I, I want to kind of get into this by asking you, what, what's the motivation level for this team right now? Um, Maryland has been eliminated from bowl contention. They're coming off of a bye week. Um, what, what's the motivation for this team to, to come out and play? I know that this game is going to be senior day. Do you get the sense that these players want to – spoil something for nebraska or that they want to end the season on a high note like where do you get the where do you get the sense this team is at yeah and that's actually something i was writing about this week and and kind of asking a bunch of players about um of course players are always going to make it sound like you know they're they're motivated and i think they are but but i do think it's pretty genuine for this team um because like you said, the, the senior class, and, and you look at what the group has gone through. So the seniors, if, if they've been there for five years, they've had three head coaches and two interim coaches. And then they obviously had all the turmoil last year with the death of Jordan McNair. And, and the players were probably the only people in that situation who did nothing wrong and, and had to grieve the most. Um, so, so I think when you look at the relationships they, they have with each other, by way of going through what they've gone through, I do think there is a genuine sense of let's let these seniors have kind of a moment to enjoy. Um, And and maybe they realize that Nebraska, because Nebraska struggled, perhaps presents a decent opportunity um, to do that. So so I think motivation is okay. Um, 
a bowl game is always the benchmark at Maryland. So I'm sure there's a little bit of a, a letdown for that, but, but it was, it was seeming far gone a while ago. The Ohio state loss is what officially got Maryland out of contention. Um, but I think everyone saw it coming uh, long before that. Do you expect there to be a pretty good crowd on hand Saturday for senior day? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an issue at Maryland. Um, attendance is, is just really bad. And, and it, it, I mean, pretty embarrassing, like from a program standpoint, just to look at it. I know from the press box, like I, I usually try to take a picture at a kickoff, just, just to say like, Hey, I'm at the game. And it's like always flooded with comments of just how horrible it looks. Um, I think the three thirty kickoff will help. Um, noon is, is, it seems like a hard time for, to get people out to games. And the thing about Maryland is a lot of times attendance is kind of beefed up by the opposing team. So when you have like Penn State come, they have a lot of fans come down. Obviously, D.C. just has a lot of people and a lot of fans of teams who might only have one opportunity a year to to watch Michigan or Ohio State or whatever team they cheer for. So I kind of wonder how that will be affected by Nebraska, which is uh, certainly not an easy trip out here and definitely not a marquee game. Um, So I, I don't really expect there to be uh, too much uh, of an atmosphere I know that might be kind of a, a letdown uh, answer but it's kind of the reality here not, not necessarily a letdown I, I'm really looking forward to this game I think it's going to be a fun um, back and forth game I think there should be a lot of scoring I, I'm, I'm excited to see what this is going to look like um, we can get into the kind of the nitty-gritty of it the, the first phase of the game that I want to start with is special teams um, because Maryland special teams is crazy to me when I look at them um, on paper. They've only made one field goal all season long. How does that happen? Yeah, no, it's really bad. So, so the kicker, um, Joseph Petrino, he he had like this crazy awesome streak last year as a freshman. I think he went like ten attempts before he missed, and, and it was like I think he was one of the last kickers in the country to miss. It, it was really impressive. He's kind of heading into sophomore year, and we were talking to him before the season. That's the only time we've been able to talk to him. Um, and, and you know, it's kind of like hopefully he, he's going to have a longer leash and get to try some longer field goals. And it just hasn't been the case. Um, he's he's made one of four, and and miss some short ones. So, so it's, that's been an issue. And you think about how that affects everything, you know, it changes how much you might want to go for a fourth down. It changes what you can do inside, you know, on your, on inside the 50 even. So I think that maybe even affects the offense more than, more than we realize. but, but it doesn't give Maryland a good opportunity to just get some points. Um, so, so special, I mean, like you said, special teams have been really weird um, overall, kind of bad but then have obvious some obvious highlights um on like kickoff return with with javon leak so um a, a really interesting unit for maryland yeah and that was going to be my next question the highlights um maryland is one of the best punt and kickoff return teams in, in all of college football um nebraska is terrible in all aspects of special teams do you think that that can be a serious advantage for maryland as long as the game doesn't come down to a field goal do, like have, have players talked this week about we, we can really flip this game on special teams yeah i mean it, it has been something that's come up specifically but I, I haven't watched a ton of nebraska this year but but that's interesting that you say that they've really struggled there um because javon leak he He's about to bring, and, and, and he knows this. Um, so I, I wonder if it, um, you know, comes into his mind at all. But if he scores another touchdown on a kickoff return, he'll break the all-time school record for that. I think it, it would be his fourth career um, score. And and I think you know that's something that swings the game so quickly. Um, whether it's whether it's to start the game or whether it's just early or a way to kind of bounce back from a Nebraska score. I, I think that does a lot. Um, in the Michigan game, Michigan scored on the opening kickoff, and it just kind of felt like a, a gut punch. So it's like if Maryland can do that to, to Nebraska, which is a team that, you know, I, I was writing today, like Maryland should be competitive. Like, like that should be the benchmark here. Not even win or loss, but if Maryland's not competitive, that's really worrisome um, for Maryland. But, but, a, but a kickoff return for even if it's just 50 yards or just a long kickoff return that puts them in good field position, um, I, I do think that it's one of those type plays that's always it always feels like it can kind of swing the direction of a game. Yeah, well, Nebraska dealt with that just last week. They they scored um, to go up seven nothing on Wisconsin in the first quarter, and then um, the ensuing kickoff, Wisconsin took it back to the house to tie the game, and that kind of just sapped um, a lot of the energy. So, yeah, it. I, I agree with you. Um, I think Maryland 
should be competitive. I, but before we get to the offense, I have a question for you um, that's that's more specific. Who's playing quarterback? Um, <laughs> I feel like I've, we've answered that. We've had to answer that question every every week, and that's never good for a program. Um, I I think it's Josh Jackson will start, and Terrell Pigram will have a few series. That's kind of been the theme of the year when everyone's healthy. Um, Josh Jackson missed three games with an ankle issue, and then and then since then he's kind of he's been back and and starting. But but Pigram offers things that Josh doesn't. So, he, you know, he's really mobile, and I think Maryland likes to design a few series for him. It, it's it's very much a, a thing where they go in expecting, I think, both to play. And then the other one that's a little more of a wild card is uh, Lance Lejean, who's the freshman. He has he will have his red shirt intact if, even if he plays these last two games. And I think it would be prudent for Maryland to do that. He's he's really good, too, and, and like Pig Rome is, is – very mobile and can run and, and showed some good flashes of things late in the, in the two games where, where he's played. So I think honestly, I, I would bet that we'll see three different uh, quarterbacks, but it'll be maybe 75% Josh Jackson. Okay. Does that quarterback carousel or that sort of uncertainty at quarterback, has, has that contributed to um, an up and down season offensively overall? I mean, Maryland's the only FBS team this year to score 70 in a game and give up 70 in a game. Um, the offense had <laughs> 70, what was it, 79 in the first game, 63 in their second game yeah. of the season, and they've gone over 30 just one time since then. Like, what, what are some of the contributing factors to, um, I, I, you could call it a slump maybe, like what, uh, with the way that this yeah. offense is played? Is it uh, entirely dependent on the quarterback, or are there other issues? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome stat, <laughs> the getting 70 and giving up 70. But um, I, I think it's a lot of things. I think the later stages of the season is more true to what this team is um, than Howard and Syracuse. And, and I think we just didn't realize what Syracuse was at the time. Um, and, you know, I don't think anybody did, obviously they were ranked and, and people thought it was, they were a pretty good team. Um, now we've realized they are not. And, and what the offense in those two games, I don't think is indicative of kind of their potential against like a solid big 10 team um but that said injuries have played a role but I mean I hate even really going down that path because it's like every team has injuries every team has injuries at key positions and then you know Nebraska knows that um so the quarterback thing was an issue because Maryland had a stretch in October that really looked like maybe you get a win or two or three when it was uh Rutgers Minnesota um Purdue and Indiana and they only came away with one win, and that was Rutgers. Um, but then Josh Jackson missed those other three games. And I do think he's still the guy that gives Maryland the best chance to win. Um, so I, I do think the quarterback issue played into it. Um, and then Anthony McFarland, best running back, has been dealing with just lingering ankle issues all year. So I think we've probably only seen like half of what he what he could have been. He had such a great year last year. Um, and then the offensive line just hasn't been able to really hold its own against um, kind of the elite Big Ten uh, defensive front. And, and then that's an issue, too. So so it's kind of all around just an inability to compete with with the great Big Ten defenses um, and some injuries that haven't helped the, the cause there. Let's go to the, the other side of the ball. Um, the last six losses for Maryland, they've given up an average of 49 points. Um how much of this is is strength of schedule um because it hasn't been easy they they played Indiana and a good Minnesota team and Michigan and Ohio State or or is it something like what is attributed to the struggles on that side of the ball was Mike Laxley expecting this this um i guess struggle defensively or has there been some slippage that he wasn't anticipating yeah um i i was worried about the defense heading into the year um and then I felt kind of silly for that, you know, a few weeks in, I was like, Oh, they look pretty good. Um, but it's, it's a young defense. It's a defense. I was replacing a handful of starters um, and then had some injuries. Tino else is a starting quarterback cornerback and, and he's out for the year and he gets, he's a senior, he gets replaced by a freshman. And it's kind of like, that's been the theme of, of the year on defense. Certain guys go out and, and they have multiple freshmen starting. Um, but, but I don't think that's all of it. It really, the secondary has just looked confused and, and it's been 
really bad. You know, like just watching the game, I remember against uh, Purdue, um, you know, Purdue didn't even have its top choice at quarterback, and then they're just kind of throwing all over uh, Maryland's secondary. And then on the flip side of that, the the front hasn't been able to really stop the run game either. So it's just it's just been a rough year, and I would probably look more at the more at the secondary um, for where the issues start. The two outside linebackers, Shaq Smith and Keandre Jones, are both transfers, and I think they they've been a bright spot um, in the secondary. And, and fresh, the freshman Nick Cross has been a pretty good addition at, at safety. But um, it's just it's just been I don't know if it's communication. I don't know if it's, they're just young, but um, it, it's been a struggle all year on defense. Okay, who are um, three Maryland players that Nebraska fans should be aware of before Saturday? Um, let's think. I, w- I would probably say Javon Leak um, for what we were talking about on special teams, and and he's kind of come come out as um, the go to running back since Anthony McFarland's been hurt, and then. For I would, hmm, there hasn't been like a receiver who's really emerged as the top guy, um, but Dante Demas has been. He's had some great games, and then and then had struggled in the last few games. But maybe against a Nebraska team, he's able to have a few long catches. So so he'd be kind of my receiver pick. Um, assuming it's Josh Jackson, I think maybe maybe they're able to connect a good bit. And then on defense, I'd say um, Antoine Brooks mainly because he's a senior and, and just kind of one of those guys who who has stayed the course and is always high energy. And, and I think he's someone who the staff looks to as a player who who's always giving full effort. And, and you know, m- maybe he makes something great happen on his senior day. So so maybe I'd, I'd look to him to come up with an, an interception or, or something like that. Okay. What about three keys to the game? Um, let's see. I go with special teams, maybe just because we've talked about that and it's fresh on my mind. So I think maybe Javon Leak on, on special teams, if he's able to have some of those momentum plays or whatever you want to call them um, to give Maryland good field position. I think, I think that's pretty crucial, especially for the offense that has struggled a bit. You know, if you can, if you can let the drive start on the 50 as opposed to the 25, I, I think that makes a big difference for Maryland. Um, I think the offensive line it, it's it's kind of a patchwork group missing a few starters. Uh, Terrence Davis is a is a veteran guy who there he had gotten hurt and they're opting to hold him out um, and kind of keep his red shirt intact so he can come back next year. And then Johnny Jordan's the starting center and he's out for the year. Um, so you kind of have some young guys, some older guys, and it's just it's it's a group that struggled. So I think if they can do an okay job of, of protecting whichever quarterback it is and enabling the run, I would say Maryland has a much better chance. And then I'd say the secondary, um, just because in the games where Maryland has looked really bad, it seems like the secondary hasn't done a good job of just uh, defending the pass. And, and what happens is the opposing offense is just kind of, um, impose their will on on Maryland's defense and by way of just throwing whether it's a quick slant or just letting receivers beat Maryland's defensive backs um, it's been an issue so I think if the secondary can play a little bit better then um, that'll help Maryland out a lot too. What do you think the score is going to be in this one? Uh, I, I think Nebraska wins. <laughs> like I, I just Maryland has done so little to give me faith and in, in the team. Their only conference win is Rutgers and, and I know uh, Nebraska's conference wins are Illinois and Northwestern, so you know, not exactly confidence inspiring either. Um I think maybe I'd say Nebraska wins, but Maryland is competitive, so maybe like twenty eight, twenty four. Maybe more high scoring than that, like 42, uh, 38, or something like that. Maybe like a four point win um, for Nebraska, but but Maryland looks okay doing it. I'm kind of right there with you. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't really have confidence. It's it's crazy how um, similar both of these teams are. It, I mean, it, it, if you take a step back and think about it, it really is crazy how similar. Yeah, both of these teams no, are. I I completely agree. Um, I think I think Nebraska's looked a little better than Maryland, but both have been pretty disappointing. Um, you know, maybe more so for Nebraska because some of the expectations were so high. But I think both are kind of clinging to these last two games to try to instill a little bit of hope and, and salvage uh, what this season is. So I, I do think they're in very similar spots. And, 
you know, maybe Maryland gets a little bit of an advantage playing at home um, and, and can, you know, maybe would pull out a win. But but I, I think Nebraska uh, wins close. Okay. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got work to do, but I have one more question that I did not prepare you for that's kind of off the cuff. Do okay. You have a, do you have a restaurant recommendation for somebody like myself who is traveling or a Nebraska fan who is traveling to the game? What is one place around um, campus or the university that people should absolutely eat at? Um, okay, so I mean, <laughs> my first thing would be it compares. It depends on where you're flying in. Are you flying into D.C. or uh, Baltimore? I believe we're flying into D.C. Okay, so so most of my recommendations come in D.C. Um, because that's where I live, and and I, I go to Maryland a good bit because I I work there, but I'm not usually like hanging out there. Um, I know one place in College Park that I haven't been to, but I think like even Loxley has mentioned this and, and a lot of people who live there there's a place called milk and honey cafe that's like a breakfast place um that people like in college park and then there's a somewhat dc chain called bus boys and poets which has a locations in both uh dc and college park that that i've been to that's pretty good um in dc i feel like all my recommendations are breakfast foods which um maybe that's all i eat out at but that's not a problem. Um, there's a place in dc called called the coop that's good and then there's uh, my mom was actually just here um this weekend when on the bye week and we went to um it's called ted bolton and we didn't actually eat because there's like a two-hour wait but you can get these like pop tart things that are that are pretty awesome um so yeah lots of lots of good breakfast options but i always whenever people ask that question for road games i always end up pointing them more toward dc i mean college college park is is fine um, but when you're so close to the city, I feel like why not um, spend some time in, in the D.C. area, which is, which is kind of nice this time of year um, when yeah. it's chilly and um, the fall. So I, I do I do enjoy D.C. For sure. Yeah. Every time we have a road trip, uh, there's like a running joke with my team that I'm always asking for pancakes. So um, breakfast places oh, really have recommendations. Yeah. I, I get pancakes at the Coop, which is um kind of in, in the city, not near the airport, though, so I don't know if you'd be around, but that's actually what I had uh, this weekend, so they're oh. very good. <laughs> well, now I know where I'm going. Emily, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for giving us some time. Yep. Um, where can people Thanks follow so you much. on Twitter? Um, on Twitter, I'm at Emily, and then my first four letters my last name, which is G-I-A-M, uh, and then I watch and post. It's just thewashingpost.com. Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. Yep. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week with another podcast, Nebraska's final week of the regular season. I'm sure a lot of people are hoping it's just regular season and not final week of the season when it comes to football. So keep it with Hale Varsity throughout the weekend. We'll have coverage. Football, men's basketball, women's basketball, volleyball. It's going to be that time where everything is going on. So keep it with HaleVarsity.com. We will be back next week with another podcast. Thanks, guys.